I ask you, Father God, I just ask you to use me this morning. I ask you for your Holy Spirit to fall down here, Father. Fill this place that all we see is a fog. And we know it's you. Father, I ask you to speak through me. I ask you to hide me. You know who I am, Father. I'm just I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody that's so precious. And that's you, Father God. I ask you to touch lives here this morning, Father. Move in a mighty way. Open eyes, open their ears, open all of our eyes and ears. Our hearts, soften them. Father, we give you this service, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit. I've got a glass here. Just a, a glass, just a drinking glass. And I, I want to ask you, how can I take the oxygen out of this glass? How could I take the air out of this glass? You know, I did this one a few times in different places at revivals, and one person got up and, I mean, he hollered real loud. He said, put a vacuum pump on it and pump it out. Do you know what would happen if you did that? It would destroy this glass. It would destroy it. This glass is me and you. It's me and you. Anybody else have an idea of what it would take? She took all of my glory. <laughs> Praise God, she figured that out. This is the only way to fill this glass and to take the oxygen air out of that glass is with water. I wish my mic worked. But you, and this glass is like us, and this is the Holy Spirit. And this glass is full of sin. We're flesh. We're, we are born lost, going straight to hell, and Jesus died that we could have life. And we still have that flesh after we ask him to come inside of us. And we have a choice to feed the flesh or feed the Holy Spirit, feed who we are. And so the Holy Spirit comes and, and, and you ask him into your heart and he starts filling your heart full of the Holy Spirit. And as you get closer to God, the more you grow, the more you read, the more you pray, the more you love, the more you walk by faith, that Holy Spirit just gets fuller and fuller and fuller. I run out of water, but Jesus didn't run out of Holy Spirit. You get the idea. God fills us with His Holy Spirit. You see, victory in the Christian life is not accomplished by by just sucking out sin here and there. Just God get rid of this sin and pulls it out and pulls it out. Something has to come replace that void. Does that make sense? And only the Holy Spirit can take that void. You know, when I really got right with Christ... His Holy Spirit started changing my life and the sin started leaving me. And the more I searched Him, the more I read the Word, the more I fellowshiped with like believers, the more I went to church, the more I put Him first in my life, the more sin left my body. <laughs> I tried so hard to quit drinking beer on my own. 
I tried so hard to quit cussing on my own. Denise didn't like it. I tried so hard to quit dipping Copenhagen. I tried so hard to quit living for me and worldly treasures. It didn't work. So finally, I, when I found Jesus and I said, I'm ready to serve you, and he came into my heart. He took away alcohol. That Holy Spirit just started filling me. And he took away cussing. And he took away dipping. Oh, how I love to dip. If I could preach and dip, I'd do it. I did that 25 years. I started when I was eight years old. My granddad had a hardware store, grocery store. And man, I would, I was a little thief. I'd go in there and get me a can of Copenhagen, put it in my boot and go. My wife had to love me a lot when I dipped. How can you kiss somebody with a dip in their mouth? I wouldn't kiss her with a dip in her mouth. But she showed me unconditional love. She Thank you, Father God. Thank you for thank you for your Holy Spirit. So this Sunday we are on a journey. <laughs> We're on a journey to let the Holy Spirit start filling us. You know, I had a lot of stuff written down I wanted to share, but it's like the Holy Spirit said, no, I want, and I'm going to read it out of my phone. Is that okay? I'm going to use some of this technology for God instead of the enemy using it. If I can figure out how to run it. If you want to have your Bible with you, you can turn to Ephesians 1. Man, I love Ephesians. Paul, as far as I'm concerned, he hit the mark. He hit the mark when he did Ephesians 1. When he did Ephesians, I mean, when he wrote Ephesians, he, he hit the mark. He spoke the truth. It's like a caveman can figure out how to live for Jesus. We don't have to ask because it's right here in Ephesians. I need to tell you this too. Did y'all know that when Paul wrote Ephesians, he was in prison. He was in chains. They had him bound by his arms. They had him bound by chains. They had guards all around him because they were afraid of him because he was doing some damage to the worldly world. <laughs> And they wanted him silenced. They wanted him dead. But he didn't stop. He kept writing. And he wrote this to the Ephesus church. Verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace them. And peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus. I don't hear anything in there saying, come get me out of jail. <laughs> oh, do you realize what I'm going through? You wouldn't believe what they're doing to me in here. No, he was praising God and he was praising God for this church. He goes on to say in verse 3, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realm and with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And get this, I want you to understand this. It goes on to say, For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. He chose us. To be here this morning. He chose us to be disciples of Him. Before the creation of the world, He knew us. That's hard for a dang old cowboy to wrap his head around. <laughs> How can that be? 
And it says, In love He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and, and will to, to the praise of His glorious grace which He has freely given us in the one He loves. Wow. I don't deserve to be here this morning. I don't deserve to be your pastor. I don't deserve to have a wife like I have or a family like I have or to have y'all love. I mean, I don't deserve it, but with God's grace, He's brought me here. And, and I'm blessed to be able to do that. See, this ain't just by accident. Your life isn't by accident. He predestined you. He goes on to say in verse 7, In Him we have redemption. What does that mean to have redemption? Can anybody tell me? Huh? I can't even hear. I can't hear him. I'm sorry. Sound like a duck quacking back there. <laughs> Just being honest. Redemption. What did he say? Can you hear? Dave, did you hear him? Bought back. Praise God. That's where duck was coming from. <laughs> he bought us back. He died for us, and we have a choice to have redemption, to to change from what we were born, how we were born, and to become who He called us to be. Redemption. It couldn't happen without Jesus dying on the cross. Not only do we get that, but we get to be have that same Holy Spirit in us that raised Jesus from the grave. I had some warriors play for me last Sunday after church. They anointed me with oil and they prayed over me and I left here that Sunday after church with it. I'm ready to fight a battle. We need to be there for each other and pray for each other. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure which He pursued in Christ to be put into effect when the time reaches their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In Him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of His glory. What would have happened if all them disciples would have lived their life like we all live our life today? Truthfully, here in the United States, I mean the majority of church churchgoers, I mean, what would have happened if we would have done what they did? I don't think any of us would be in jail in chains, would we? <laughs> We wouldn't even have had a shot at being a Christian because it would have died right there. We, we, live, we live here and we are so spoiled. We have people all around us lost and all we worry about is ourselves. So if, so if we would have been chosen back then to be disciples and do what we do today, Christianity wouldn't have got past first base. I believe that. Oh, Father God, help us. Thirteen, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Whether you know it or not, if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you're a believer, you have been marked with a seal and it's the Holy Spirit. You have been chosen 
to do mighty works for your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You're all pastors. Did you know that? You will touch more people than I will touch if you want to. The promised Holy Spirit, verse 14, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. Wow. I'd like to read all of Ephesians. I guess we can just start reading it every Sunday and we'll get through it. Paul goes on to talk about thanksgiving and prayer and he says in verse 15 for this reason ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people I have not stopped giving thanks for you remembering you in my prayers he's talking to us today I don't, I've never been in a more loving church than this church right here and I mean that with all my heart The Holy Spirit's here every time we're here. He's here when we're not here. And you all know how to love. Because that's why people come here. It's to be loved. And your love for all God's people, that's so important. He goes on to say in 17, he says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that every day for our church. Grow us, Father God. Give us wisdom. Give us knowledge. Give us a thirst and a hunger. Verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope in which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his people, holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. We haven't even touched the, the tip of the iceberg of the power that he gives us. I think we're all going to, if we know Jesus Christ and when we die and we go to heaven, you're going to be blown away when you walk in there and it's not cement floors. And you're walking on what we strive to get here. Let's face it, we're after material things. That's the world. We're after that money so we can have what we want. And then God makes it a floor to put my dirty old, yeah, man, feet on the floor. I got manure and a horse. We walk on it. That ought to show us that it's not worth much here either. Gold is not worth much here, yet the world chases it down. Verse 19 is his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion in every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the, in the one to come. You have that power inside you if you have the Holy Spirit in you. He says with just a, a mustard seed faith, you can move mountains. He didn't just put that in there so we could read and feel good about it. He put it in there to tell us that, man, all you have to do is have faith of a mustard seed. And you can say, mountain of sickness, you can be, be removed. Mountain of finances, 
Show me, Father. If we'll walk with God, he promises that he'll give us our needs and he'll provide for us. I see all them little sparrows in the winter outside my window at the house and at the ranch running around and and I'm going, how do they survive? It's, it's zero out there and they're still trucking and they can find something to eat. He provides for them is what he says in the Bible. I provide for them. Why don't you think I'll provide for you? Verse 22, and, and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way i could make a i could write a message on every verse i'm reading there's so much there if you just you may read this tomorrow and you'll get something else out of it that's why bsf is so important is you go study this and it'll be people will tell you how they feel how what it means to them and you'll go oh wow You see, we were dead in our transgressions. We were dead in our sins. And God brought life to us. Even though we die the earthly death here, we are still alive. We're going to live forever. It goes on to say in chapter 2, it says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. And of the ruler of the kingdom of, of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, the devil. I'm so ashamed that I used to be like all these people that's not walking the walk. I can't believe that I was there. It goes on to say in verse 3, All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying and craving of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Some of us are still doing that. We can't follow the flesh, the desires of what I want. I have to follow the desires of the Holy Spirit. This is hitting us right where this is talking to me and you. It goes on to say, like the rest, we, are, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by, by works, so that no one can boast. So many people think that, man, I'll, I'll, I'll go to church. We don't have that problem here. Because we have a problem getting people to help. But a lot of churches I've, I've been a part of, man, there's people that they just darn near run that church and they think by the works they're going to heaven. They spend all their time working, but their life and their, and their walk with Jesus is not there. They try to control everything. They try to destroy, and they don't even know they're doing it. I hurt for them. It says in 10, it says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God pre prepared in advance for us to do. There it is again, prepared in advance. How many people, how many people has God put in your path long as you've been a Christian that he wanted you to help and wanted you to share the message of Jesus Christ with him how many people and we haven't
when I first went in the message in the ministry I, 30 years ago, I could ask the church, I'd say, how many led someone to Christ the last month? And there would be some hands go up. And I'd say, well, how many's led somebody to Christ the last six months? And there'd be hands go up. Or I'd start with a year and then I'd go down. But today when I ask that, nobody raises their hands because nobody needs people to Christ anymore. They're too busy living for themselves. It goes on to say in verse 11, and I'm not going to read this right here. You can go home and read it, but it's, it talks about Gentiles and the Jews. They were different, opposite people, and, and, and we are the Gentiles. We've been grafted into the Jewish, God's people. We were grafted in just like they were. We were given the opportunity to be Christians to be a part of Jesus Christ's family or God's family. And it talks about that there. In verse 19 in, in chapter 2, it says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as a chief cornerstone. Can everybody in here this morning honestly raise your hand and say that Jesus is a cornerstone of your family? That Jesus is a cornerstone of your business? That Jesus is a cornerstone of your, of your life? It goes on to say in 21, In Him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a, a holy temple in the Lord. And in Him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. We're a temple. Our church is a temple. We're a body of believers here. I remember when the Holy Spirit came in me, I felt different. I was different. To come to be a Christian, we, we are changed. And we can't keep living where we've been living and be a Christian. He changes our heart. He changes our thoughts. He changes our love for people. He changes my love for Denise. He changed it. I remember her exact words was, I don't know what he did to you, but I sure like it. If you have marriage problems, if you'll seek Jesus Christ, both of y'all seek Jesus Christ. When you do, it's like a triangle. Here's Jesus and here's the two. And the more you seek him, the closer you get. And that's with your family. That's with your friends. That's with... Everyone. I want to read one thing. I'm going to come back to Ephesians, but I want to read what, uh, in Ephesians, and it and it starts in in chapter four, and it's verse seventeen. And it's Paul's instructions for a Christian family. It's not my words, this is it's for Christian living, each one of us to live by. 17, it says, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are all full of greed. That however, it, how, that, however, is not the way of life 
you learned. That's talking to us. It says, Valencia County Church, when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude in, of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in, in true righteousness and, and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we, all, we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not, let, do not sin. And do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Verse 28, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Wow. Do not let, let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Well, that stops people in their tracks right there. Let's gossip a little bit. If we can't say something positive, if we can't build people up, don't tear them down. Don't say nothing at all. Verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed, for the day of the redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. I can work on that. I can work on that. Father God, help me get there. Help me, Father God. I want to be used by you, Father. It says in verse 1 of 5, it says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual impurity. I mean, that's in serious in our culture today. We, there, there's a survey. I've got a message I've been working on of the devils destroying our kids. And these kids are experiencing sexual intercourse by the age of 10. It's rampant all over. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immor Im immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. People living together, not married. And the list goes on and on and on. Nor should there be any obscenity or foolish talk or coarse joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. And then it goes on to say in verse 5, For as... For of this you can be sure no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an adulterer, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ 
and of God. Wow, that's pretty strong. That's not me saying that. That's God saying that. It goes on to say, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Verse 8 says, for you were once darkness, but now you are the light of the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all good goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Man, he hit that on the mark, didn't he? The days are evil, they're terrible. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Cindy, you're going to like this. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. we got to have that. And then it goes on to say this. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So uh, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. What does that mean? To do it for God. Because you love God so much, you're going to do love someone. <laughs> you're going to be who he calls you to be. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. That's hard to do, isn't it, ladies? We live in a world where women's lib is like man it has destroyed families <laughs> that may sound harsh to you wives but let's go and see what the what the men are supposed to do this is where it gets tough it says husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or even any blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own body. He who loves his, he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body. But they feed and take care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of His body.
that's pretty high standards to love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's kind of like dying to self, ain't it? <laughs> it's like Jesus died on the cross for us, that we're supposed to do the same thing, men. Be there for our wives. Love them. It says to share the word, teach them the word, make them white as snow. I pray when somebody sees Denise, they, they don't look at the outside. She is beautiful to me. But I pray they see what's inside her. And how she's a wife to me and how she submits to me and how, how she's quiet. And how she loves the Lord. This is the first church in 30 years that she's done something other than be my wife and and come and us work together and ministering. She's running the... She really don't want to be up there. But nobody's here to do it. But she stepped up and did it. She holds me accountable, but she does it in such a gentle voice that I can't help but listen. She sent me a text yesterday, I love you forever and ever and ever. <laughs> Little heart kisses. Love each other. Love each other. Don't look at the one bad fault in your spouse, but look at all the good things in your spouse. Verse 31, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Like, man, it's, you can't separate it. If you take that the flesh and split it, they'll die. <laughs> like they're one flesh. Made for each other. Forever and ever and ever. It says till death do we part in our vows. And the Bible talks about that. But me and Denise have made a pact that we're going we're gonna to go to heaven together. We're going to spend eternity together. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of, of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. That's profound right there. It, I have to love Denise, but all she has to do is respect me. In the King James, it says she reverence her husband. That sounds a lot better, don't it? Reverence means to love him so much. The same way that we're supposed to love God. Well. He goes on to say in 6, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. I've tried to do that. I honor my dad and mom still today. I still listen to my dad. I still honor him. I'm going to take God up on that promise of long life. I don't care what the doctors say. I'm going to take him up on that.
Fathers, do not es e exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instructions of the Lord. Wow. We raise our kids and they go run around out here and we don't train them up in the Lord and they get in trouble and we get mad at them. We want to give them a whipping when it's all our fault because we're not bringing them up in the Lord. So whose fault is that? I'm going to stop there. I pray that we're like this glass of water that we continue to let ask for that Holy Spirit to continue to fill our cup. And to understand that that he takes away your sins. You can't you can't do it by yourself. You're either for him or you're against him. You're either Christ or you're antichrist. There's no in between. There's no gray area in this deal. And it people get mad at me when I say that. Oh, I'm a good guy and I I'm Bob I said, I don't care if you're a good guy or not. If you don't have Jesus here, you're of the lost. You are of the Antichrist. You're of the darkness. If you don't live for Him. In Jesus' name, Amen. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord.